Greetings, everyone. This is Minister Adam Butts with JCC Sunday School Lesson for March 15th, 2020. The title for today's lesson in Boyd's commentary, as well as Towson's International, is Consequences for Injustice. Sunday School is now in session. Again, the title for today is Consequences for Injustice. Our scripture comes from Habakkuk chapter 4, verses 6 through 14, which reads, But soon their captives will taunt, taunt them. They will mock them, saying, What sorrows await you, thieves? Now you will get what you deserve. You've become rich by extortion, but how much longer this will go on? Suddenly your debtors will take action. They will turn to you and take all you have while you stand trembling and helpless. Because you have plundered many nations, now all the survivors will plunder you. You committed murder throughout the countryside and filled towns with violence. What sorrow awaits you who build big houses with money gains it dishonestly? You believe your wealth will buy security, putting your family's nests beyond the reach of danger. By the murder you committed, you have shamed your name and forfeited your lives. The very stones in the wall cry out against you and the beams in the ceilings echo the complaint. What sorrow awaits you who build cities with money gained through murder and corruption? Has not the Lord's heaven's army promised the wealth of nation turn, will, will turn to ashes? They work so hard, yet all in vain. For as the water fills the sea, the earth will be filled with the awareness of the glory of God. Amen. A little background as we get into this week's lesson. As I mentioned last week, there's little known about the prophet Abaca. But the meaning of his name is embracer or to embrace or to hug. His book is one of the 12, 12 books written by the minor prophets. The term minor prophet is given to the 12 smaller books following the five major or larger books by prophets such as Isaiah and Jeremiah. Habakkuk is lamenting or expressing sorrow or suffering to God. Last week in chapter 1, Habakkuk brought the perplexity of his concerns to God about the leaders of Judah living the high life while the righteous suffered. Habakkuk mentioned his continuous prayer and asking God to rescue his people from the evil leaders. He asked, how can God lay dormant during the destruction and violence overpowering the faithful? He says because of God's inaction, the law of Moses was no longer relevant as the wicked surrounded the righteous, the guilty were set free, and the innocent stood accused. Therefore, judgment would actually pervert it. In God's own timing, he answered Habakkuk the first time. But God said that he would send the Babylonians, a people more evil than the Israelites, and they would come and judge those evil leaders in Judah. Obviously, after waiting such a long time to hear an answer for God, Habakkuk was not very pleased when he got the answer that God had said. In fact, God's plan was worse than Habakkuk could have ever imagined, which led to him lamenting even more. Habakkuk believed that God could do all things, but he had an honest doubt about God's plan. He continued to ask God about how can he be so holy and right, yet watch his people, the seeds of Abraham, the descendants of David, suffer such atrocities at the hand of the Babylonians who were a people far less righteous to them. In fact, the Babylonians, they were rising up to world dominance by means uh, of, of killing and stealing and doing anything and everything as they marched across the world, destroying everything. Then chapter two actually picked up um, after Habakkuk had finished voicing his concerns. Chapter two says he sat on his watchtower awaiting God's second response. See, a, a prophets were considered watchmen at those times. Watchmen were set in the high towers 
And their duties was to look over um, the area very diligently to see what messengers or enemies or what dangers or deliveries were approaching. But Abaka waited on the watchtower for an answer from God about his honest doubts about God's plan. Finally, God begins to respond, actually with the well-known scripture. In um, verse 2 of chapter 2 of Habakkuk, God answered saying, Write the vision and make it plain upon tablets, that he may run that readeth it. God tells Habakkuk here to write down what he's about to say. Make it large and simple enough that the messenger can read it and run with it. And moreover, take action. We find the same state um, saying used all the time um, in, in different meetings when you're talking about goal setting and so on and so forth. But in this case, God is telling Habakkuk, I'm about to give you this vision. I want you to write it down. I want you to make it plain so whoever reads it can take action right away. Moving down a little bit further um, uh, in Habakkuk 2, 4, he said, God's then go on to say in verse 4, Behold, his soul which is uplifted and not upright, but the just shall live by his faith. God was first talking about the Babylonians, then he was talking about the faithful. So the Babylonians, they, their soul were puffed up or swollen and prideful. But there was no righteousness in them. They were not justified. On the other hand, he that believed in the promises of God, he that had found life through believing, shall live by his faith. The just shall live because of their faith in the fact that God will bring them through all the pain and all the suffering, regardless of how it actually looks or feel to them at the time. The just shall live by faith. Our lesson picks up today um, with God giving three of the five woes that he was set upon the Babylonians. Again, woe is a funeral cry. Ro woe are things um, that cause sorrow or distress or troubles. God responds to Habakkuk is saying woe to the Babylonians. These woes were the consequences of the injustices that the Babylonians pressed upon Judah. As we dive into our lesson, we'll find just how remarkably modern, modern these woes seem to be. Even though they were written to describe the ancient Babylonian culture at the time of Habakkuk, the Babylonians looked to their own man-made gods and military power to give them security, which they sought to attain by a total disregard for rights and dignity of others. And because of their action, God says, whoa. The first woe comes in verses six through eight, where God pronounces woe for their illegal gains. Verses six says, but soon their captors will taunt them. They will mock them saying, what sorrows await you thieves or woe? That awaits you thieves. Now, you would get what you deserve. You've become rich by extortion, but how much longer will this go on? Suddenly, your debtors will take action. They will turn on you and take all you have while you stand trembling and helpless. Because you have plundered many nations, now the survivors will plunder you. You committed murder throughout the countryside and filled towns with violence. In these verses, they're, they're like taunting songs where the righteous will sing and mock the Babylonians as they are getting exactly what they deserve. Remember, God is talking to Habakkuk in a vision. So what God is telling uh, Habakkuk about these five woes, they won't take place for another 70 years. But God is telling Habakkuk this, who and whoever that read this after Habakkuk writes them down and make it plain, to give them that comfort that God will rescue them in his timing. 
Now, as we look at this, the Babylonian Empire, first of all, was merciless in the way they plundered small nations and forced them to pay an absorbent amount in tribute money. God says, woe to him that still increase in their dominance by invading other neighbors. As we look at verse 7, what it says, suddenly your debtors will take actions. Here, God, uh, God tells Abaca, um, and, and you suddenly... For the Babylonians, they were relying on their own power and they didn't think that any evil was intimate to them. No one could attack them right away. And if anyone did rise up against them, they believed that it wouldn't be so sudden that they couldn't, you know, in time resist them and drive them away. See, the Babylonians had this worldly smart about them. They indeed ruled, ruled far and wide. But God declares here that the wrath is coming soon to them, which will happen suddenly and overwhelm them and take from them what they took from others. Then as Habakkuk, moved, or as we move down to verse eight, Habakkuk speaks to the reason why the woes were coming upon the Babylonians. Basically, the treachery that they dealt will be the treachery that they receive. The people that they left behind and they didn't destroy throughout um, the nations, those people will be the ones that rise up against them. The Babylonians will now reap what they saw. They sow. Well, how does this apply to us today? Or does it apply to us today? Well, the answer is absolutely. Is it possible that we're getting ahead right now by taking what's not ours? What about a loan that we might have taken out that we didn't repay? What about taxes that we may not have paid? What about charging unfair rent or for houses or buildings that we may own? What about paying taxes on cash gains or unreported income? Lastly, yet most importantly, will a man rob God? Malachi 8 says, should people cheat God? Yeah, you cheat me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did I ever cheat you? It goes on to say, you cheat me of my tithes and my offering do me. Not paying tithes and offering is spiritual, illegal, uh, illegal gained and illegal gains. And God pronounces woe for illegal gain. As we move down to our second woe and we get into verses 9 through 11, God pronounces the woe of stepping on others. Verse 9 read, what sorrow awaits you who build big houses with money gained dishonestly? You believe your wealth will buy security, putting your family's nest above or beyond the reach of danger. But by the murders you commit, you have shamed your name and forfeited your lives. The very stones in the walls cry out against you and the beams in the ceilings echoes the complaint. See, Babylon had trampled or trampled over all the nations and cut off many people um, in order to build up their powerful and their secure impact. Habakkuk says that the plan um, uh, that they have, uh, uh, the plans of those who acquire great wealth by sinful means or those who exalt themselves and their family to such a power and such greatness that they believe they're out of the reach of their enemies are mistaken. In fact, there will be a time that their own confusion will lead to their ultimate extermination. It was if the Babylonians had this fortified nest built on a foundation of skeletons and tortured bodies. Babylon had cruelly stepped on weaker people so they could rise themselves up to higher heights. God said that even the timber, the timber and the stones and the ceilings of, um, that they fortified, uh, fortified around them were witness against the evil of climbing higher by stepping on others. 
God proclaimed that Babylon will be brought down by her lofty nest on high. See, an eagle, the bird we are talking about here, the eagle, they normally build, they build very heavy nest and, and on very high trees. The nests are so high that most predators, such as other birds or tree climbing sta- um, snakes, they, they can't get to them. So Babylon thought that if they build their houses high above the fray of the common people, they will be protected on every side. The problem is they were stepping on the heads of people as they climbed higher. The same people they mocked were the people who was building, building these dwellings that they actually lived in. So after a while, the Babylonians were virtually locked themselves in an environment where they were naturally surrounded by their enemies. They built it up so high and they stepped on so many people. The people, the, the Israelites were surrounded them on the ground while the Babylonians stood on high. However, Habakkuk pronounced here that their homes will become their prison. The houses that they live in will actually become their tombs and the land will become their burial sites. They can't get higher by building on the backs of other people. Well, how can we apply this woe to our lives today? Getting ahead and stepping on others and taking advantage of others is evil. And God pronounced woe for this sin. Therefore, woe to you. If you are climbing the corporate ladder by stepping on others, woe to you if you're making yourself more secure and more comfortable comfortable um, in your church or in your ministry by putting others down or by forcing them to leave the church. What God has for you is for you. He will not require you to step on someone else or gain um, seniority by belittling, belittling others. We sometimes make, make other people feel less worthy. So in our selfish ways, we can still feel better about ourselves. God would not require you to rob a bank or take advantage of someone else to buy a car or to buy a home or to pay your bills. God pronounced woe for stepping on, belittling and take advantage or taking advantage of others. Our third woe that God pronounced to the um, to Habakkuk about the Babylonians is about boasting and self glory. This woe takes place in verses twelve through fourteen, which reads: Has not the Lord of Heaven's army promised that the wealth of nations will turn to ashes? They work so hard, but all in vain, for the waters fill the sea. The earth will be filled with the awareness of the glory of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, the cities of Babylon of the Babylonian Empire were built by the blood and the sweat of enslaved people. Babylon built um, their cities for the glory of Babylon. They didn't do it for the honor of God. Remember how King Nebuchadnezzar bragged before he was cut down his size in Daniel 4 chapter I'm sorry chapter 4 verses um, 30 through 31 God pronounces woe for vain glory for the glory of self and not for the glory of God think of our nation this nation was actually built on the backs of enslaved people but what about currently How is our nation currently built? Is it built for the glory of God or is it built for the glory of man? Now, we may say one nation under God, but God is not even allowed in our classrooms or in our workplace. The glory of man is certainly promoted in the classrooms and in the museums and in the theme parks of the country, but not the glory of God. If we're working hard to build our nation up and to glorify man, and not give glory to God, then we're working and laboring to feed the fire. That's what he's uh, back is saying in in verse 13. If it's not for God, then we're laboring, laboring to feed the fire. We're working in vain. It will all burn up in the end. This not only applies to our nation, but it applies to us individually as well. 
if we are building a career for ourselves and not taking the Lord's will into, into account, we are working in vain. In the long run, it's not going to count. It's like laboring only to throw expensive logs into the fire. Because there's no room for self-glory in the end. In fact, brothers and sisters, anything that we can touch or, or feel or, or see right now is temporal. It'll fade away. We can't take it with us when we pass from this earth. But in our edification of God, the work we do in his name, the suffering that we endure in his name, as we die to our own desires so he may rule over our lives, that's everlasting. That de- Those deeds we can take with us. And for those deeds, we can receive a reward. We will receive an internal fellowship with God and an internal life for all of that. For those who is us who set our hopes on him, Jesus said he is going to prepare a place for us. But we can't take anything with us that we can currently touch or feel. And this place that he's building up for us, there's no money needed for the debt is already paid in full. God is saying that he is the one that get all the glory, all the honor, And all the praise, not us. Verse 14 shows us that um, God's glory will be revealed one day. And at that time, every knee shall bow, not just to Christians, but every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Habakkuk shows us two ways that we can cope with the injustices that we may have to face right now. One, when we're in the face of injustice and we have to suffer through that pain and and, and endure, we have to hold on to the vision of the reliability and the sovereignty of God's rule. God has us. Secondly, we have to believe in the ultimate power of God's justice and his holiness. Habakkuk was convinced that injustice will not stand forever before a just and holy God. As we go through the pain and the suffering of injustice, we need to focus on Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, the second part, which says, The just shall live by faith. So regardless of what we're going through, regardless of what's going on around us, we have to put complete trust and confidence that the God who knows us before we were born has a plan for us. And that plan is one of good and not of evil. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this concludes our lesson for this week. Once again, this is Minister Adam Butts with JCC Sunday School Lesson for March 15th, 2020. Be blessed.